Hello Systematic 2, I hope you all are healthy and well and enjoying our beautiful spring weather. So um, we're going to get started. So today I'm going to offer my rebuttal. Um, just a reminder, I was plural elder congregationalism model. That was um, the defense I gave last week. So we're going to um, look at some things I agree with, disagree with, the other three um, church models that are given. Um, so again, I would like to thank everyone. Um, for their presentations, I learned so much. I honestly didn't know much about many of the different types of church polity, and they really were enlightening, um, if nothing else, to myself. Um, so I'd like to get started. So I'd like to first touch on the Presbyterian model that Sister Griff so beautifully did a presentation on. Um, so there are a couple things I agree with. So I completely agree that elders serve a large role. Um, elders are vital to the church. Um, they. Um, are just key and core members that definitely serve places of um, honor and in leadership capacities um, and uh, she would agree with this. Um, something else she would agree with is um, ordination so that is very important. Um, that is an option um, in the plural elder congregationalism uh, model of government. Um, it's not necessarily a necessity but um, I would agree that it is very important. Um, and again, they're used in just many, many important church functions. Elders are key players in the church. Um, something else I'd agree with is checks and balances. So she mentioned um, that the church, the uh, Presbyterian model, does have checks and balances, and I would completely agree. Um, you honestly can't have a an effective and efficient, a well-functioning church without some type of checks and balances um, to make sure that everybody... Um, you know, stays in line, if you will, um, not dictatorially, um, but just in a way that makes sure, you know, everyone has a place and they fill their role as needed. Um, there were some things I disagreed with, though. Um, General Assembly was one of them. Um, so in the plural elder congregationalism model, um, we don't have any type of General Assembly. Um, a church using uh, any type of eldership form um, should be a complete entity unto themselves, I believe. Um, they should be fully functioning themselves. Um, in plural elder congregationalism, we fellowship with other churches, um, but we're not um, dictated by them what they do or um, higher leadership of any form. Um, we, again, are um, self-sustained, I guess you would say, inside. Um, that is how it's set up and how we try to keep it. Another... Um, thing with that uh, would be that accountability definitely comes from um, our congregation and our fellow elders. So it's not, again, looking to a general assembly or a higher power, um, besides God, of course, um, higher leadership, I should say, to um, guide us and direct our decision making. That's definitely something that um, falls to our congregants and to our fellow elders. So something else um, was elder roles. So the Presbyterian model, um, I know, divides their elders between um, teaching elders and ruling elders. Um, we don't do that in the um, plural congregationalism model. Um, we actually just let them follow their giftings, their strengths, their leadings. Um, I would hate to put someone in over a ministry where they're not um, strong or they're not adept in um, not that we can't learn new things, but um, some of us do. We do have our strengths and things we're just simply better at. Um, and so we really want to follow after that. We don't relegate our elders to just one or of two categories. Um, we really let them follow after their giftings or callings. Um, so another thing I disagreed with was succession. Um, so apostolic succession, um, something that the Presbyterian model does follow. Um, it's simply not biblical. Um, it takes all of the power away from those that make up the church. Um, leadership should be elected um, in-house um, and done so in-house among the congregation. Um, succession should not just happen by someone from the outside coming in. Um, and moving along, I would like to um, talk about the Episcopal form of leadership Brother Eli presented on. Um, so I would completely agree with elected church members. Again, we do believe um, election within the church is vital. Um, he said that presbyters and pastors are elected. And again, um, your leaders, I think, should be elected by the church. Um, it just makes sense that the church, the core group that the people are the church. So it just makes sense that they would elect the ones who are going to shepherd over them. It just is common sense, in my opinion, um, that this would happen in such a way. 
So then we move on to um, ordination. So you'll recognize that some of these um, topics that I'm talking about are very similar between Episcopal and Presbyterian. Um, I think they are. I found them to be slightly similar. Um, so apologize if I am um, repeating myself, but I'll go into a little more detail. So again, um, with the Episcopal model, ordination. So um, it is an important form um, of um, institution, I guess you would say, um, or honor within um, different types of church polity. So it is very important to this form. Um, it's also very important to the plural elder congregationalism. Um, if a group is to lead a congregation spiritually, I would agree that ordination is worth serious thought. Um, it has many benefits and can only serve to strengthen an eldership um, and the churches they serve. Um, but, however, in plural eldership, as I mentioned, it is not a requirement, um, so it is simply personal preference. Um, if your church would prefer that you're ordained, then you tend to be ordained. Um, so then I moved us on to some things that I disagree with. So, um, again, talking about a hierarchy, um, there's no need for a hierarchy in the church. Um, accountability comes from the fellow leaders and their constituency. A hierarchy really, at the end of the day, defeats the purpose of serving together as the body of Christ, as one body. A hierarchy kind of messes with that. We really don't want to do that. We want to serve um, together as laborers for him. And then appointments um, can be very dangerous. So leaders outside of a church do not always know what is best for said church. So um, appointments, for instance, if someone is appointed, um, an elder from outside to come in our church, um, they don't know our church, they don't know how um, things are um, run in the church, they don't know the people. So I think it's very important that those things are not done um, by appointment. Um, so while the Episcopal model is definitely correct in allowing um, their congregants to make some major decisions, I do believe they are mistaken in allowing leaders to be appointed by an outside council. Um, and another point of disagreement would be the continuity of succession. So similar again to the Presbyterian model, uh, succession here is hierarchical. So however, new leadership I believe should be democratically elected. Succession opens the door to the possibility of incompatibility in the church. Um, and this can have devastating effects on a congregation if they don't mesh well. Um, again, if they're not familiar with the people, how things have run for years. Um, if people just have different personalities, it really, um, much more should go into that. And I think succession, unfortunately, kind of does away with that um, uh, background, almost, if you will. Um, it kind of just places somebody where they're going to be placed and doesn't take into consideration all the other factors that are at play. So then we're going to move on um, to the single elder um, model of government that Brother Andrew uh, presented on. So um, just as he mentioned, this is um, most like the plural eldership. The single eldership and plural eldership are most alike, and so um, there are definitely some things that we agree on. But um, it also, um, I found myself finding more things we disagree on, but they tend to be just one or two things um, that really are distinguishable in how single and plural elderships um, veer away from each other. So I completely agree that um, he mentioned that it is not healthy for dictatorial leadership styles to be at play in the church. So I would completely and utterly agree with that. Um, there's no room for um, a dictator in the church. Um, again, we should all be working together. Um, we should be serving our constituents and not, um, you know, bearing down on them. Um, that's not how a church should be run. Um, so I would completely agree with that. And again, accountability uh, comes into play there, kind of helps mediate that, make sure that doesn't happen in the church. But moving on um, to the points that we disagree on, um, primarily the senior head of leadership um, that is key in a plural elderism, um, I'm sorry, a single eldership, um, but in plural elderism, um, it's not so. So the Old Testament is not applicable here, we believe, as the New Testament is the church we're modeled after. So we really don't look at the leaderships of the Old Testament as much. Um, it's definitely going to be the New Testament for the plural eldership. That's what we're focusing on. Um, it's unbiblical as rarely are singular forms of leadership mentioned in the New Testament in the church. Um, the primary examples are that when you hear of elders being called, it is um, more often not multiple, it is plural elders called. Um, many are called to minister in the church and to work in the church. And another simple example would be Jesus called um, 12 disciples. Um, again, 
to spread and lead the church. This is a group, a plural eldership, if you will, um, that best served the kingdom. Um, God could have done it by himself or could have just chosen Peter or John, but he chose to have a group, a plural eldership around him. Something else that um, Brother Andrew talked about was that um, someone will eventually take the lead as per human nature. Um, so I disagree. Um, in this plural eldership, we uh, mediate this in a number of ways. So um, before elders are chosen, they are vetted, and often they actually work together, um, so they have a good working relationship. Second, um, going in, uh, our elders, we know that we are equal. So we know that there is no room for a dominance of one party or one elder. Um, we know very clearly that um, there is, you know, it's an equal playing field. So three, accountability of fellow elders in the congregation as a whole helps curtail any form of supremacy among the group. Um, it really helps um, keep us humble, if you will. And then finally, the elders know that we are more productive and more in the will of God, and we serve him equally without um, a head leader, if you will. Um, and finally, um, Brother Andrew talked about human weakness. So we want to preface, of course, this is um, a part of us. No one is perfect. Um, but similar to someone taking the lead, accountability is key here to combat this. So in a single elder model, if the pastor falls, unfortunately, everything falls. Um, in plural eldership, if an elder is struggling, they have other elders to lean on. And if, God forbid, um, human weakness does prevail, the model ensures that there are still leaders in place to help pick up the pieces and carry on um, after that fall. Um, the church can carry on just as strong. Um, a single elder model must usually start from the beginning at this point and find someone to fill that role if their pastor uh, leaves or falls. Um, but plural eldership kind of does away with this. They don't need um, to start from the beginning. They actually um, have others that are ready and willing, other elders, to step into the vacant position that is there. So that is my rebuttal. Um, thank you so much again for all of the information. I really learned a lot, and I hope that you did today as well. Thank you so much, and God bless.